You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. How many of you are excited for the Word of God this morning? I hope you are. And uh, we, have, we started a series a few weeks back. We've called it Family Matters. And uh, when you think of families, there are always issues, aren't there? There's trials and there's blind spots and hardships and misunderstandings. How many know family can sometimes look messy? Am I the only one? Come on, are you with me? Family can be messy, but we also said that family matters means that family is important. And, it, and we realized at the first week that uh, family was God's idea from the very beginning. The root uh, verse that we're kind of the anchor verse for the series is found in Psalm 127. I want you to turn with me there. I want you to highlight this. I want you to write in the margins. If you write in your Bibles, I want you to write family matters. And uh, the verse that we've been highlighting is first uh, uh, is the first verse of, of Psalm 127. And this is what it says. It says, unless the Lord builds the house. You could put in there, unless the Lord builds the home or unless the Lord builds the family, the builders labor in vain. It's all vanity if God is not at the center. God better be at the center if you're going to make it. And we ask the question, well, how would you know if God was in the center of our families? And that was kind of the introductory week, and we kind of laid some groundwork and some foundation. Last week, we broached the, the topic of marriage. And how would you know if God was at the center of your marriage? What if a, a husband said, well, I believe in God, or I believe in Jesus, or a wife said, I believe in Jesus, but then acted nothing like it the rest of the time. They never put priority, never served, never gave, never well, was in church, never read the Bible, never prayed. It would be just a word, and you could say to that husband or to that wife, that, yes, you might believe in Jesus, but even the demons believe in Jesus. And how many know you don't want to be married to a demon, right? <laughs> and so, so we want to we want to know more than just lip service. We want to give our hearts and our lives, and our marriages should reflect something of Christ if it's God centered. Am I right? And last week we started with a tough message, and we talked about the pull of the world on our marriages, and that there are marriage myths, there are lies within our culture that are fueled by our belief, and they will drag us down. They are, they are not godly. And we talked about three myths, and then we ended last week with three spiritual truths. Let me remind you, it was forgiveness, love, and oneness. And in each of those cases, the idea was because we are forgiven, we can forgive in our marriages. Because we are loved completely by Jesus, we can love in our marriages. And because God is one, we can have this picture of covenant that we can be one. And co a covenant relationship is not just two individuals, it's actually three. A husband, a wife, and with God in the mix. And it's a beautiful picture of oneness. And because we are, because God is one, we can be one in our marriages. Well, today I want to take a second look at marriage. And I want to take a quick survey, kind of see who I'm talking to here. I'm wondering, uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you are married here this morning? Just lift up your hand. All right, so a bunch of you are married. Okay, all right. How many of you are single this morning? All right, oh, yeah. okay, so a, a bunch of you. Uh, so, right, let's do that again. Let's do that again. How many of you are married? Just uh, raise your hand. Okay, all right, okay, all right. Uh, and then how many are single? Go ahead and keep your hands up and just look around. I mean, I know, I know you're here. I mean, this could be a great place to find your future <laughs> mate. I'm just saying, right? I mean, what better place than at, at church? And you think I'm kidding. Uh, Pastor Pale and Jen, Genevieve back here, and they're in their 70s, right? And maybe, I mean, 
maybe even 80s, right? Uh, they, they're leading the way. Uh, they found each other in a small group. And uh, second marriage, both their, they lost their spouses. And, I mean, it's a beautiful story. I mean, it could happen, right? And amen. <laughs> I remember when Pastor Pale said, uh, I, I said to, to Pastor Pale, I said, man, man, I, we just love Genevieve. And uh, what a, she, and he goes, well, so do I. <laughs> and I, I'm like, okay, I knew something was happening at that point. And uh, how awesome is that? So, all right, all right. So back to the married. If you were married, how many are still feel like you're on the honeymoon? All right, anybody? All right, oh, yes, all right, good. Uh, but it's seriously, any newlyweds, anybody newly married in the last, you know, a uh, little bit. Any newlyweds here? Okay. Newlywed over here? All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, I was just thinking about it. For me and Jessica, it, it's like 21 years of honeymoon. It's, it's just been incredible. I've just been asking, when is this honeymoon going to end? <laughs> Picture perfect marriage, model in every way, no issues, just blessed. <laughs> Seriously, if you've been married for more than a week, you know that there are issues, right? <laughs> I ran across something, the difference between a newlywed and someone that's been married, and I thought this might be fun. You can easily detect someone that's, been, that's a newlywed because newlyweds will leave a love note on the kitchen table if they have to go away for just 20 minutes. On the other side, if you're married, you might leave the house for six hours without thinking of telling your spouse where they're even going or if they'll ever be back. <laughs> How about this? Newlyweds still lock the door and use air freshener in the bathroom. I didn't write this. <laughs> married people, they have seen it all and they smelled it all. Why waste the time closing or refreshing <laughs> or freshening up? <laughs> Newlyweds will spend three days planning and cooking their spouse's favorite six-course meal. Come on. Married people, they buy microwave meals. <laughs> uh, newlyweds they will spend all their cash on cards and candy for their spouse. Married people, they buy lawn equipment or power tools, right? Come on, guys. And then last one, Mary, when newlyweds had their first fight, oh, can you remember your first fight on your wedding day? I mean, or, I mean, I mean, on your honeymoon, I mean, when you got home from your honeymoon, they'll spend days making up. When married people have a fight, they can get over it and start one less than five minutes later. <laughs> and the truth is, it's, it's so true. No matter how well you think you know your potential spouse or you know your spouse, if uh, you, could, you could have all these things, you could have known your, sp your potential spouse or you know your spouse forever, um, it, but you may have had the best pre-marriage counseling. You could have scored 100% on your compatibil compatibility test. Um, but the reality is uh, we all know that as soon as you're married, there will be problems relating and understanding your spouse. And you say, well, why is that? It's because of human nature. And it's good to understand that. And it's good to understand God's design. And it's important to know uh, that we can turn to God's word for instruction. How many believe that God's word can help our marriages? Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, it's one of the classic New Testament texts on marriage. And we're going to get our minds around that. I just want to mention, if you're taking notes, you can jot down two other sections of Scripture. The one is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 3, uh, verse 7. And then also Colossians 3, 18 through 4, verse 1. And these are parallel passages to the uh, text that we're going to study in Ephesians chapter 5 today. And it's interesting in Ephesians chapter 5 in particular that this idea of marriage, this picture of marriage, is dropped into a context um, that is talking about being rooted in a God-centered life. And I want you to turn with me there to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and, but we're actually going to start by looking at chapter 4 from a paraphrase idea. 
in Ephesians chapter 4, it starts off talking about unity and maturity within the church. And then in verse, uh, verses 17 through 32, it, we get this instruction to have God at the center, that to not live like the Gentiles, and that we are called to be different as believers. How many would say amen to that? We see this idea of true righteousness and holiness as our target in verse 24. And then we're encouraged to put off falsehood, to speak truth, not to be uh, sinful when we're angry, not to give a devil a foothold, not to have any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths or to grieve the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 31 and 32, we see this idea of forgiveness. We talked about it briefly last week. That if you are going to live a Christ-centered life, you better be able to forgive and to kind of follow these instructions. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, we are encouraged to follow God's example. And then it goes on to verse 20 to not live sexually uh, immoral or to have any impurity or greed or obscenity or foolish talk. In verse 16 and 17 of chapter 5, it says, Be very careful how you live. In verse 18, it says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're talking about having a Christ-centered life, keeping God at the center of everything. And then in verse 21, it's the pivotal verse. I want to start there and read. Look what it says. After all this instruction of how to live a Christ-centered life, It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If Christ is at the beginning and at the middle and at the end of your life, if he's at the center of your life, so to speak, we need to model submission. And just as we are reverent towards Christ himself, to keep God at the center. How do we do that? We submit to one another. And then it's important to see what happens here. Then Paul, for the rest of chapter 5, he uses wives and husbands as an example of how to submit to one another. And it relates to Christ and Jesus' relationship. And that is the standard. Let's look and let's read from verse 21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. We talked about that last week, that covenant relationship. It's a profound, we can't understand it completely. But I am talking about Christ and the church. It goes on. However, each of you should also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. From that point on, uh, Paul continues to talk about how uh, submission should be seen uh, to one another, even in raising kids, uh, how fathers should be submissive in, her, in the family, how masters, uh, those that, uh, uh, that own, um, own property or own business, uh, they, they should respect uh, their employees, and as an employee or a slave, how you should respect and submit as well. And then it, the whole chapter, the whole book is uh, rounded off with the armor of God. And we're not going to take time to look at that. But I want to be back in the marriage idea. Uh, many say that verse 33 is the key to a strong, healthy marriage. Let's look at it. It says, however, each of you, this is talking to husbands here, 
should also love his wife. So husbands should love their wives as he loves himself. And most guys don't have a problem with that. <laughs> Am I right? And the wife must respect her husband. If you boil it down, it comes down to love and respect. When you're dealing with any man or any husband, if you want to get close to his heart, you should respect him first and foremost. And with a woman, if you want to get close to any lady's heart, any woman's heart, you need to love her. See, God's design is that men, by nature, they want and need to be respected. On the flip side, women want and need to be loved. You say, well, don't men need to be loved? Don't women need to be respected? Yes, there's a measure of that for sure. But the primary is for men to be respected, women to be loved. From a marriage standpoint, Dr. Emerson Eckridge has done a lot of work around this. Some of you may be familiar with his book called Love and Respect. Or maybe you've been through a class like Jessica and I have. In fact, several years ago, we took some of you through this class. And in that class, they talk about the crazy cycle. Let's look at that. At the top, it says, without love. That's a husband that doesn't love his wife. What will happen? Crazy happens. It says that she will react. Now, I'll let your imagine run wild with what that could mean in your situation. But the same is true that if she, the wife, does not respect her husband, the husband will react as well. And it's a crazy cycle. And it goes round and round. And it causes a lot of issues, it causes a lot of pain, and it's a lot of hardship. How many, just a show of hand, have ever experienced crazy in your life? marriage. Come on, be honest. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm talking to the right crowd. Anybody want to share a story? No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. You can just keep that to yourself for the moment. But the problem, what happens is this crazy cycle, it just feeds off of itself and it spirals and it kind of just works its way where, where you're saying, man, all I want to do is flush it down the toilet, right? And, and it's, it's just crazy out of control. And the problem in this is you, as a husband, you cannot stop and say, well, I'm just going to demand my wife to respect me. You shouldn't do that, guys. Yes, it does say women should submit, but you don't go around saying, submit, woman, right? I mean, that would be the wrong idea. The same is true. A woman can't demand love. A woman can't sh- kind of put a halt in this crazy cycle and say, you need to love me. You have to love me. Or like, you have to love me. <laughs> the husband's thinking, no, I don't. I don't even like you right now, right? (laughs) And you see the problem? You can't just stop it in in mid-sentence. And I remember going through the love and respect material, and the thing that stood out, the thing that Jessica and I remember most, we've talked about it, is there's a little phrase that Dr. Uh, Egridge says. He says, whoever is most mature will act first. Remember? Remember? Oh, this is, this, I mean, I remember that. And we've talked about that a lot. So if you're going to stop this idea, if you're going to stop the crazy cycle, as a woman, you need to give respect first. Or a husband, you need to love first. Because when it comes to unconditional respect, ladies, it is a powerful thing for your husband. The same is true, men, when you give unconditional love, It is a powerful commodity for your wife. It's like oxygen for men and women to be loved and to be respected in the right way. And when things are working properly, that crazy cycle gets flipped upside down and it actually gives energy. Let's look at the energy cycle that Dr. Uh, Emerson talks about. On the top, it says his love. That's a husband's love. This is an empowering love. It energizes his wife. It motivates a wife to respect him. And when a wife begins to respect her husband, it will energize a husband. It will motivate him to love her. 
And this is the positive cycle. And it can happen in a healthy marriage. You say, well, what is a husband's love? This is uh, found in Dr. Egridge's material. In fact, we've made this available online through our resource page. I mentioned uh, each week, and I want to encourage you uh, to go online because there are so many resources. What we want to do here is just to give you a tip of the iceberg idea, and we want to give you just enough to crave more. You say, man, I need to learn more about this. You can go online, and there's lots of resources there. But when it comes to what is a husband's love, how do you see through a woman's perspective, loving her for who she is in God's, in God's image. Here's a couple things. This is how you do it, guys. When you love her and you want her to, uh, to be with her face to face and you aren't secretly mad at her or when you empathize with her or when you resolve or reconcile with her, when you are completely committed to her or when you treasure her above all else. Those are a few uh, bullet points with the idea of saying, guys, this is how you love your wife. On the flip side, for a woman, how does a woman love her husband? And what is that, or respect her husband? It's by appreciating his desire to work and achieve. And the emphasis is on desire and not performance, saying it's not how well he does, but his desire to work or to achieve. Or for appreciating his desire to protect and provide or appreciating his desire to be strong and to lead and to make decisions. Guys, we like that, don't we? Or a, a woman can love or respect by appreciating a, a husband's desire to analyze or to, uh, to give counsel. Appreciating his desire to for shoulder-to-shoulder friendship. And the last one is appreciating his desire for sexual intimacy. These are a few things that Dr. Egridge talks about in his love and respect. And uh, these are things that will kind of keep the marriage energized and keep it going. The priority in marriage is love and respect. And if we can get our minds around this idea, it will take our marriages to a whole new level. And I've seen it happen where the light bulb goes on and there's uh, issues. And then a husband says, you know what? I'm just going to love my wife no matter what, and it changes things. Or on the flip side, a woman uh, says, you know what? I'm going to give my husband respect, even though he may not deserve it, and it changes things. And God, he gets the glory. And it's rooted right there in verse 33. You know, I was thinking, our marriages matter to God. Remember, it was his idea in the first place, his idea of a family. And when it comes to our marriages, for those of us that are married, and it's about probably half of us here, if you are married, get this in your brain. You are married to one of God's sons or daughters. Think of someone, uh, one of your kids. And I don't have kids that are married yet, but some of you do. If your child was married Don't you want that spouse to love and to respect your son or daughter? The same is true when it comes to God. He desires us to love, to respect. And you know, the standard here in in, uh, Ephesians is a high standard. The the relationship, the, the ideal, is a relationship between Christ and his relationship with the church. And last week we talked about covenant, how there's a covenant relationship in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. The same thing is true in a covenant marriage that uh, the marriage is really a picture or an essence of God. We got the Father God, we got husband and wife, and it brings a covenant relationship, three as one. In a similar way to this, we see effectively how to live out our marriage by following the example of how Christ relates with the church. And that's where I want to spend the rest of our time looking at this in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 22. It says, Wives, submit to your, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. This is assuming that wives are have a God-centered uh, relationship with Jesus. And how you would submit to Jesus, how you submit to the Lord, That's how you should submit to your husband. Verse 23 continues, For the husband is the head of the wife, 
as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. So it's given this picture of Christ being the head of the church and how there's a submission here and uh, that, that there's this idea that even Christ submitted to, uh, to the Father and how that works. Verse 24, now as Christ or as the church submits to Christ, so the church is saying, look, Christ is the head of the church, so wives should submit their hu- to their husbands in everything. This is incredible when we get our minds around this, this idea of submission. And it's not an idea of, of like a, a thumb pushing down. The, the idea here is a, a willing submission saying this is how it should be. And then it goes on. It talks about the Christ in the church regarding to the husbands. It says, husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How many know Jesus loved the church so much that he died? He gave his life sacrificially for the church. And in the same way, husbands should love their wives. Verse 26, uh, and make her body or make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word. That's an illustration of what Christ did for the church, right? Verse 27, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Guys, we can love our wives to the point where there is a, a picture of Christ in the church, and it's a beautiful thing. Verse 31 talks about that covenant relationship. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. It's a profound mystery, verse 32. And then verse 33 is that anchor, that there's this idea that husbands should love and women, wives, should respect their husbands. For husbands and wives both, church, it takes a Holy Spirit perspective, laying down their lives for one another. That's the truth. It takes a whole lot of work to get this going. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of effort. If I were to ask how much effort is needed, I would say a whole lot. See, that marriage is not like planting a tree, taking a seed and planting it in the ground and patting it in the dirt and then you walk away and you leave it and that seed does all the work when it's watered by the rain and the sun comes out and that seed bursts forward and makes this uh, beautiful tree. That's not how marriage is likened. Marriage is more likened to building a house or building a church down the road. It takes a strong foundation. That foundation better be right. It better be level. It better be strong, right? And that foundation is Christ Jesus. But then the marriage is built brick by brick, one piece at a time, put into place to create a beautiful mansion or a beautiful home as God is the foundation. See, a great marriage is one brick at a time, and it takes a lot of work. And I would just want to say that anything that's a lot of work or that's worth anything is worth the work. And I would just want to speak to those that are struggling in your marriages in some way. Maybe you're here today and no one even knows how you're struggling. Maybe you've got this picture-perfect idea, this Facebook uh, presence that looks like things are okay, but you know right beneath the surface there are issues. The work that you invest in your marriage, it can make all the difference. It's worth the work. Don't give up. Say, well, what do I need today? Uh, Some, uh, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would do an incredible work in our marriages here at the Gateway Church all across the board. That's been my prayer, my heart. But some people come, some couples come with a three-word prayer. It's a three-word prayer that has never been answered. And the the prayer is, Lord, change him, if you're the wife. Or if you're the woman, Lord, change her. 
God doesn't answer those prayers as readily. Let's try another three-word prayer that works every time. Lord, change me. Where husbands say, Lord, help me to love and not just demand respect. Where a wife would say, Lord, help me to respect, not just to demand love. Where couples would come together and say, Lord, help our marriage to look like you and the church, a picture of perfection. And you come with humility. And you come with this soft heart saying, God, I need your help. This morning, my heart for you, especially if you're married, that that would be your prayer. Lord, change me. Because when God works on you, and you put the work in, God, in His great mercy, can change even the worst situation and bring that crazy cycle to a pitcher of energy. And that's what God wants to do in this season in your life. Let's pray. Lord, I'm asking that over these next few moments that you would do a deep work in us. Lord, no matter what our circumstances look like, I pray that our hearts would cry, Lord, change me, shape me, mold me into what you want me to be. Husbands and wives, those that are single, those that may be engaged, God, I pray, Lord, that you would work in us in a deep way. Jesus' name. Now with your head bowed and eyes closed, if you have any hope, I would say, of having a successful marriage, it starts like we started our series with a Christ-centered focus, that God has got to be at the center. And if you're here this morning and you are away from God or you've never had a relationship with Jesus, we want to offer you what we call the gift of salvation. It's a free gift. It just recognizes that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. That we, if we're here today and we're breathing, we have sinned, we have, we have made mistakes. All of us have. And the reality is one mistake that is unforgiven would keep us from an eternity in heaven. One mistake. And if you're here today and your sins are not forgiven, that's a scary place to be in. We want to offer you that forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're saying, man, I need that kind of forgiveness. I need salvation. I want you just to lift your hand right where you are. We want to start there. We want to pray for you. Who here wants Jesus to forgive them, to take away their sins, to make all the difference in the world? Anyone first service saying yes to Jesus? Don't want to rush this. Anyone, first service, just slip up your hand so I can see, saying, man, that's where I am today. I need the Lord to be the center of my life. I've been living my life on my own, or I've walked away, or maybe you've never accepted Christ. All right. Okay. I don't see any hands, so let me get your eyes back on me here for a moment. All right. So let's just assume that we're all believers We have Christ in our hearts. I want to talk to the married folks first here for a moment. If you're here and you're married, a strong prayer, no matter how long you've been married or how great your marriage is, an appropriate prayer for you is, Lord, change me. Lord, shape me. Lord, mold me. Help me, Lord. And if you're here this morning, you're saying, all right, I get that. And you want to focus on that this morning here before you leave. I'm just going to ask in here in a moment that you're going to respond. Husbands and wives saying, all right, God, I am going to ask you for help. I'm going 
to ask you to change me. Don't change my spouse. Change me first. Remember, he who acts first, whoever's most mature will act first. And I believe God is calling us as husbands and wives to respond. For those that are single here, I want you to keep that perspective, looking forward, saying, all right, if I had the hope to be married someday, God better be the center. Lord, change me into the husband, future husband, future wife that you would want me to be. And with that perspective, I want you to see the big picture. You're not just asking these prayers or praying these prayers for yourself or for your family immediate. When God gets a hold of a family and God is at the center, it is an example of Christ and the church for others to see. And your example, whether you're a single hoping to be married or you're here, and, and by the way, the statistics say that 90% of single people will be married at some point in their lives. Or you're already married. Your example affects others. And it makes a difference. People are watching. And so we better get it right. Amen? If you want to get that right, I want you just to stand right where you are, and I want you just to lift your hands towards God. And I want you, in your own words, to pray this three simple words, Lord, change me. And you can add to it, of course, Lord, shape me, Lord, mold me. And I just want you, right where you are, to just intercede here for the next moment, asking God to do a powerful work in your life. Yes, God, we pray right now. For each every, and every one that's here, God, that we would have you at the center and realizing that when you're at the center, God, that it means something. It means that we are going to sacrifice, that we are going to love, we're going to respect, we're going to follow your, your word, we're going to highlight your word in our lives. God, that you're going to do uh, far more than what we could imagine, but it comes with us surrendering and laying our lives at your feet. And God, I pray for husbands and wives that are praying this prayer, Lord, change me. Lord, help me. Help me to love my spouse. Help me to respect my spouse. God, I pray, Lord, that it would go deep. Lord, that there would be a change in the atmosphere in the families that are struggling. God, that the, the switch would go on and, God, there would be a change. God, I pray for those that are resisting that idea this morning. I pray that you would illuminate your presence and your understanding of how important this is. And, Lord, I pray for future mates that we would not be so concerned with the other potential mate, but Lord, we'd work on ourselves and that our relationship with you would be red hot, that nothing would stand in between. And God, I pray for the, the dozens of singles here, young and old, God, that you would do a mighty, mighty work. Lord, bottom line, we want to be close to you. And we know that when you're close to us, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. Now, if you're here and you're a husband and you're a wife and you're here with your spouse, I'm just going to ask that you turn and just uh, put your hand around them, grab their hand. Uh, if you're here with a family, you can kind of circle up. If you're here and you're single, I want you to be praying for the married couples that are here. Because what we're going to do is we're going to pray a blessing over families, over couples. And, uh, and so let's just do that all across the place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. God, as husbands and wives are hugging each other or holding a hand as a sign of covenant, Lord, I pray over these couples. I pray a blessing. Lord, I pray prosperity. I pray for great forgiveness. I pray for love. I pray
pray for respect, God, to be seen. Lord, I pray that these families, these couples would be one in you, that you would do what only you can do, bring two to be one, and really it's that oneness with you, a covenant relationship. God, I pray that you would safeguard each of these marriages that are represented this morning. Put a hedge of protection around them. Keep them safe. Keep these marriages healthy for your glory, for your honor. I pray it in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, as we go today, I pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us, keeping you number one no matter what. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Uh, Why don't you turn and greet someone before you leave this morning. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.